Okay, good question. Let's look at Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, and see what the Lord says. Um, because I don't want to answer, uh, you know, the Lord said, you shall not add unto the words which I have commanded thee, neither shall thou diminish aught. So there's a real challenge uh, to not over, um, to expand on what the Lord says and not to diminish it. But uh, it says, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Um, and so then he rounds it out in verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you shall reap if we don't lose heart. Um, basically, I would, I mean, it just if it's a 30-second answer, I'd say yes, there is a consequence in both directions for every obedience and for every disobedience. Uh, even unsafe people realize that. Um, uh, let's see, who is the guy that wrote Rip Van Winkle? Who's our um, literary scholar? Rip Van Winkle. That great English author. Uh, one line in there is so good in, in that uh, work. He said, little did he know that at the molecular level, every fiber of his body was was being affected. You know, the idea of Rip Van Winkle, I mean, it, kind of the cliff version is that he would drink and was lazy and slept all the time, you know what I mean? And that's why he's sleeping all the time, because he was uh, sluggardly and all that. But whoever that author is, what, there we go. I had no idea, a CPA and an English scholar, or a power iPhoner. Power iPhoner. <laughs> So, so what he says is in that that was a literary picture of the effects long term. Now, is it tit for tat? You know, I speed today, Lord's going to let something <laughs> bad happen to me on the way home, and I'm a believer. No, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, more like that every time I sin, it's easier to sin again. There's that, you know... It's, it's that, um, that dimension, but not a bang for bang. It's not um, like you get punished for everything you do wrong, because this is not punishment. See, you got to remember, believers are never punished for their sins. Chastisement from the Lord is not judging us in the sense of we're paying for our sin. It is... Um, because Romans 8 says that we will never be condemned for our sins because we're justified, what, it, what consequences are is when we um, incur the natural, see, within the, the laws of the universe, uh, my propensity for being lazy is enhanced every time I get into it uh, and, and yield to it. Just as discipline, it's kind of like once the people start the athletic life, there's a, you know, these jogging and runners and marathon, uh, a marathon people, they just, they get this surge. They love it. And the same thing the potato chip eaters get when they eat their potato chips, only it's going the other direction. So, um, but did I say enough or do you want me to, to, to go in? This says, whatever you sow, uh, whatsoever. So how much is whatsoever? Uh, depends on how you define it. I would say that there is a, a positive and negative consequence for every action that we do that has to do with us disobeying the laws of the spiritual realm. We are not aware of most of them. I'll just give you one example. Jesus said uh, in, in Matthew 5, he said, if your eye is single... Your whole body will be full of light. Uh, but what that would mean is, if you have an eye that is not single, you will have darkness. And he said, great is that darkness. What that means is, every time that we surrender, whether we're saved or not, our eyes 
to do things that are in disobedience to the, the uh, perfections of God, it is diminishing. Uh, that's why Christians feel cold and distant to God. They get nothing out of the word. He's not punishing them. There is a reciprocity. There's, a, there's a, an effect of, of not protecting our, the eyes of our heart and our mind from things that defile. And that's why we have grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit. Um, it's the Holy Spirit that's affected by misbehavior. And within us, he is squelched until, and, and remember, no matter how many steps away from God you take, there's only one step back. Isn't that amazing? You can see, with God, there's immediate, immediate response for any repentance. Immediately, he impacts our life. We can go 50 steps away from him, but it's just one step back. It's amazing, the, the laws that, that God has built in. But tell me what you're really asking, because the problem with me is I can answer around anything. Jeff. So not tit for tat. It's not like uh, you do this, whap, you get that. No, not like no that. There's no giant hammer. It, it, but it's not God. No, no. See, yeah. Oh, what Jeff's saying is for sins, ah, now I'll go through this. I have many, many couples. I've been counseling marriages for 35 years. Many couples come, and they've been married a little while. They're having struggles, and they finally tell me uh, what the problem is. Usually the wife looks down, and the husband looks around like this, and they say, are we going to have handicapped kids? because we were involved in immorality before we were married? And I go, what? They said, is God going to judge us when our first child is born, punish us because we lived together before we were married? Is he going to punish us by giving us a handicapped child? And I thought, what kind of theology is that? You know what I mean? But it's so human. We think that. It's the hammer. No, all the hammer... There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. God will never condemn me for my sins. However, don't be deceived. Just like gravity makes this pen drop, because God built that law into the physical universe. So, every time I lie to someone, I can say, Paul, I'm sorry, I was just teasing, I didn't mean to lie to you. In the background, Paul will gradually wonder whether I'm telling the truth. That is a consequence. Is God making Paul distrust me? No. You understand? See, that's what I said on Sunday night two weeks ago about divorce is like breaking glass. It, it's it's going to be crunched down. Now, praise God. His grace is sufficient. And there are a lot of happily remarried believers but they bump into pieces of that does God go around saying I'm going to get you there I'm going to get you there no it's a consequence every time you open the yearbook and the x is still in there that you went to high school with you know there, it, see understand there's always going to be the effects uh, consequences it's not hammer it's not God judging because we're never going to be judged in the sense of of paying a price for our sin. Justification, put all of that on Christ. Consequences are part of the, of the laws that God has put into the universe. And I'll just give you one more example. I, I've told you this so many times, but my parents took care of alcoholics from the Lansing City Rescue Mission. If they got saved at the mission, they came to our house to get back into the world. I can't believe they did that, you know? Those men used to steal stuff from our house. We couldn't leave any money in the house. Uh, they even carted off our, our stereo. I mean, you, you know what stereos used to look like? They were that long. They were wooden, you know, and the television set was that big. We didn't have one, but, you know, people had them. They stole it. And, uh, but what my dad said is he said, Johnny, that guy has been totally saved. His sins are forever on Christ, and God will never judge him for it, but he's going to have problems with his stomach and liver the rest of his life. 
that's a consequence. And they would, they would drink buttermilk. These, these uh, long-term alcoholics were always drinking buttermilk to coat their stomach because of the ulcers and whatever else. Is God judging them? No. Did they bring that on themselves? Yes. Should I go on? Did I say enough? Now, if we got into uh, a real good study, if you ever want to study something really interesting, uh, I think I mentioned this once, but uh, there is a book by uh, Bruce, Walk Through the Bible, uh, Secrets of the Vine. Uh, remember Bruce Wilkinson, the Walk Through the Bible man, the Prayer of Jabez guy? I didn't like the Prayer of Jabez. Uh, it's in the Bible, but I think he hyped it too much. This Secrets of the Vine by Wilkinson, uh, Will Kerson. Wilkin or Will Kerr? Who wrote Cross and the Switchblade? Wilkinson, so it's Will Kerson, is this guy, Bruce Wilkerson. This is the most fantastic book. It's one of those small ones that you can just read at one sitting. And he talks about John 15, the most beautiful I've ever seen. And he talks about how God chastens us, how chastening uh, and, and how God prunes us. And chastening is negative. That's when God makes us weak and sick and even takes us home if we won't repent. Pruning, we think, is chastening, and that's when God takes things out of our life so that we'll trust him more and serve him more, and we don't like it, and we think he's judging us. See, that's, that's another distinction, the difference between chastening, which is negative and punitive as far as God is trying to make us stop sinning. But pruning, which John 15 talks about, uh, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bring more fruit? Is that negative? No. But do we think and feel it's negative? Yes. And, and this, Secrets of the Vine, is a, just a tremendous study um, on this, in our minds, separating between negative consequences and positive bad things that we would think are bad that God brings into our life. Like sometimes a job loss is actually a blessing. But we would look at it as, oh, no, but God is pruning. Uh, he, is, he is taking something out of our life so he can get even closer to us. So, and that might help, too. So I better go on. Anything else? Good. Okay, what's, we had a great one at our table. I'm ready. Okay. Um, in the first week, we talked about um, schools of psychology and schools of counseling that differ. Some schools... Thank you, Linda. What, what she said, my very first time I told you that, uh, and I'll just name some names here, like there's a guy named Bob Gann uh, who wrote a book called uh, Psycho Heresy. And uh, uh, it's, it's a very, I mean, effective book. But what I think happens is uh, he would be one that would say uh, that, that you can't use uh, any psychology or psychiatry um, or uh, medications. Now, I don't mean penicillin. <laughs> I mean psychotropic. Uh, and so what he would say is, uh, you know, no, no, no. And that's what biblical counseling is. And what I would say is that, that the BCF materials are like this. They're, you know, pretty much over here. Uh, you can find a few places, I think, um, that they would, they would even allude to some of this. But what I said is that our class, number one, psychology is a behavioral science. It's the observation and classification of personality types and behaviors. The DSM-4, now 5, is, is actually a catalog. In fact, if I had time, 
there are 2,938 people in the Bible. I bet you could find one for every one of the DSM classifications. They had every type of behavior from the, the anxious, nervous, hyperactive to the multiple person and the sex addicts, whatever that one is called in DSM. So psychology observes types of people. Psychiatry can prescribe psychotropic medications that suppress non-socially acceptable behaviors. And uh, if, if you have a person that is cutting themselves constantly, that is banging their head against the wall, that is threatening suicide, that is injuring everybody around them, or that is, you know, starving themselves to death, or whatever. I mean, you know, whatever. The first line is you have to stabilize them. You have to, you have to do something to them. You have to help them. Uh, even, you know what it says in Proverbs 30? Give strong drink to those who are, in fact, well, let's look. Do you know it says that in there? Uh, let, let's go to uh, Proverbs 30. Maybe it's 31. But uh, Proverbs, uh, whoever finds it. Oh, here it is, 31.6. Give strong drink to him who is perishing. Do you know what that is? That's like, that's like what we do when people are... And, you know, they give them all of the, the uh, um, what is it that we give them when they're dying of cancer? Morphine, yeah. Which, isn't that a part of the, you know, the, the cocaine family or something like that? I mean, it's a very strong, what is it a part? What? It's an opium. There we go. It's opium. Heroin. It's part of the heroin family. Um, give, give strong drink. That was the most, you know, the strongest drug they had back then. To him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Why? Do something to help them. If they're dying of pain, help them. If they're woeful, bitter of heart, help them. But does that change their heart? No. It just stabilizes, helps them. When Elijah was suicidal, you remember that? What did God do to him? Two things. He fed him and rested him. But he didn't stop there. What did he do? He spiritually, after he was rest, I mean, he kept putting him back to sleep. He woke up, ate, went back to sleep. I mean, it took him quite a while. He, I mean, he said, I'm ready to die. Kill me. I don't want to go on with life. And many people go to that level. And the very first thing you do to them is you don't buy them a Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 plaque. You know what I mean? That, that isn't usually, at the moment, they won't get that message. God, before he revealed truth, rested, stabilized, fed, pulled him away from the situation. Remember, he takes him out into the into the desert, and he gets under a broom tree, and all that. So what I'm saying is, uh, there's nothing wrong with psychological observational science. They just can't cure anything. I mean, they, I mean, they can't cure anything spiritual. They can cure lots of behavior. They can't change the heart. Psychiatry's prescriptions can stabilize. They can't transform. Now, let, let me show you the, the effects. Look at Ezekiel 36. This is the Lord telling Israel about the power of the new covenant. And uh, basically, the new covenant is how we are saved. That's why every communion service is this cup of the covenant. Salvation, the new covenant, is what Christ accomplished on the cross. And that's why the Old Testament saints could not be perfected until the other side of the cross. Everybody on the Old Testament side were forgiven pending the the ratification of the blood sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But here's what the Lord does. Ezekiel 36, and look at verse 26. This is what the psychologist, psychiatrist, and the medical field can't do unless they're born again. 
and believe the word of God. A new heart I will give you. Did you know that the, the, at our table we were talking about a woman at the mission who had a multiple person, this is many years ago, had a multiple person disorder, it was all these things and violent and everything else, and she could go to social services and they could take her to a medical facility and they could help her get balanced with either the chemical deficiency she had or, you know, uh, she needed, you know, some of the uh, metals, uh, lithium or something like that. And they could, you know, work with her until they released her. Does she have a new heart? Do you remember when the demons left the person and the Lord said that they were like a house that was empty, swept, and garnished, and then seven <laughs> worse demons came in? What our medical field does is empty, sweep, and garnish. I'm talking about in psychological services but they never are able to seal the spirit from the intrusions that, that can destroy. So the Lord says, I can give you a new heart. I can put a new spirit within you. I can take out your heart of stone. This is a verse I use with couples that, that are saying, I can't go on. He's, you know, he's unforgivable. He's too awful. And I say, but you know what? The Lord can give him a soft heart and could take out the heart of stone. And look at verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Wow. See, that's what, what I said is um, in this course, we go in here as far as it takes into the secular realm to, to see all the different struggles people have to see how they can be temporarily uh, stabilized, to see how they can come to a place where basically uh, it's kind of like graduating from AA without ever getting saved. I have a lot of relatives like that. They've overcome alcohol without the Lord, and they're in that system. But they're still going to go to hell if they don't get saved. You understand? You understand? They don't have a new heart. They don't drink anymore. In fact, they become good citizens. You know, I'm from a complete drinking family. Uh, you know, my grandfather, when I went up to see him the last time, they were draining alcohol out of his stomach because his liver was so toxicated or toxified or whatever. I don't know the medical term. They were trying to get it out before it killed him, and they couldn't get it out fast enough. I mean, they were actually draining his stomach, to, and he died. I mean, they just drank themselves to death. What, what he never got uh, was, I mean, he had all the medical help, my grandfather did, but he never got a new heart. And so, and, and I'll say this over and over again, there is nothing wrong with taking medication, you know, within reason. Don't get addicted to it and don't, you know, trust it as, as the only way that you can live uh, without letting the Lord do this side. And, and psychologists and psychiatrists aren't demonic. They're just unsaved, a lot of them. And it's just like an astronomer that's looking at the Hubble pictures. I can look at the Hubble pictures and see God, and he sees evolution. And I can still accept what he sees as far as his observations and strip away his bias of evolution. Same here. They can observe an awful lot the behavioral sciences. Uh, in fact, when I was at Dallas, uh, Dr. Um, Howie Hendricks used to always say, even a broken clock is right twice a day. And what he's saying is, uh, there are a lot of their observations, even though spiritually they're broken, that are correct and that you can use. Um, so, Linda, did you ask any more than that? Am I going beyond what you ask? Did I say enough for you? Good. Does anybody else have a question about that? Yes, Dale. You made a comment in an earlier uh, session that sea salt was an important part of the diet, and then when it stopped being an important part, that uh, psychological problems ensued. Could you elaborate? Yes, Dale. That's one of my problems. I have a problem that uh, 
that I read constantly. And uh, when I was in seminary, I was in the old school where you could not go out of first year seminary until you passed a thousand words a minute in reading because for the rest of your life you're going to read. So they put us in forced speed reading courses, the kind with the machine that keeps covering the page faster and faster and you instantly have a test on it. That's the old school. They don't do that anymore. They just, you know, I don't know what they do nowadays. But so, I mean, I read fast, but not as fast as a lot of people. I've met people that read 5,000 words a minute. Um, uh, I mean, those are the kind that, that they just turn pages like this. I mean, they're actually reading the book. They just turn the pages. They, well, they do look down, too. <laughs> it's not wireless. But, uh, um, but because of that, I, um, because of that, Dale, um, one thing I do, just as my little porthole into the world, I read the New York Times every day. And uh, the New York Times had, had an interesting article about three or four years ago, and you can look it up. And what it was do it was, I have never found anything Christian in the New York Times other than an ad for a church. Nothing Christian in there. It's very liberal and biased. But it said, curiously, and, and they were graphing this. They were graphing, um, they had the world, and they talked about, by the continents, um, what kind of salt they used. You know, in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Africa, in North America, Central America, South America, and, you know, Oceania or Oceania or whatever they call the islands. And what they said is, in Western Europe, where they, well, not all of Western Europe, but in the British part of Western Europe, and in the, uh, a lot of the Canadian part of, and American part of North America, and in Australia, a lot of the British areas, and in the parts of uh, uh, like uh, Japan that is really, really Western, they said from these places, this is what New York Times said, 95% of all these DSM, um, multiple person, schizophrenic and all that stuff, they said they don't really have the manifestation of those things. And the article said either nobody's looking in Africa, in the Middle East, in South America, in Central America, and Asia, or they said the other thing is these societies have pure white salt. And they said the kind of salt that you get from the one that has the umbrella on it, you know, that has the iodine put in it, Morton's or whatever it is, doesn't occur that way in nature. It, it's been refined, kind of like flour. Try and find white flour that God made. You know what I mean? <laughs> he doesn't. You have to work at doing something to it to make it white. And so what they said is they found, for example, uh, in India, in the Himalaya area, they have a, 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 a trace... Uh, minerals that are in their salt that makes it a color. So you can actually go to gourmet stores and find um, there, there is some kind of salt from the Alpine area that's like a light blue color. And over here, the salt that they find in Japan has a pinkish tinge to it. And there's a yellowish. And in Africa, when they find it, it's got this blue tinge to it. And what they say is one of the things that brings color to salt are these trace metals. And what do we give people with, with all these? We give them lithium. We've taken it out, then we send it to the drugstore and we sell it to them at a thousand times the price. That was the bottom line of the article. You ought to look it up. It's the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. But it didn't say anything. All it said, it was just investigative. And right after it was the article about Hostess Twinkies. <laughs> and that every item in the Hostess Twinkies is unnatural. They said it, they, there's no butter, there's no flour, and there's no milk in a Twinkie. Uh, the white part comes from mines deep in Africa. They, they mine 13,000 feet down to get the white stuff in Twinkies. I'm glad the company went out of business, you know, so poisoning us all. Uh, but my problem is I read too much. But I'm surveying for, for topics and, you know, that catches my eye, and so I sort it. So. Thanks for asking. Now I have to confess. Okay. Yes, Chris. How do you counsel an unbeliever who's unbelieving about natural? 
Chris asks, how do you counsel an unbeliever whose unbelieving spouse passed away? Uh, well, the first thing you do, all of us as humans are to have compassion. And so you, you, know, you sorrow with them, you love them. I would wait till they're buried, you know what I mean, um, and, and all that. But then, um, I'm trying to think because uh, I do this because I have unsaved relatives. It is a very careful thing you do because the first thing you do is as soon as you tell them they are in hell, they don't want to talk to you anymore because they immediately... And so what I do is I talk with my relatives. I just talk about what God says about the future, what God says about the spirit world, what God says about heaven. And I pray. And many times, in fact, Bonnie's grandmother, typical example. Bonnie, when her, when her grandfather was dying, Bonnie went right to him and begged him to come to Christ. Got on her knees, read the Bible to him. She had just gotten saved herself. She begged him, warned him of hell, and everybody in the family uh, wouldn't even talk to Bonnie for months. They just, they, because of course he rejected. He was an alcoholic and a womanizer and everything else. So they rejected it. So they all were hard and impervious to the gospel. So Bonnie and I just started doing this where we would talk and say, yeah, well, yeah, the Bible talks about the future and the Bible talks about this. Well, one by one, when they're all alone, they'll come and they'll say, well, what does it say about what happened to Dave? You know, the grandfather that died. And you go, oh, there's actually a chapter in the Bible about that. Oh, if Jesus says it, they might accept it. So you go to Luke. You know, I mean, you guys know the rich man and Lazarus. You just go to Luke and you, you say there was a righteous one that died and an unrighteous one that died. And look where the unrighteous one went. You don't tell them. You don't say, ha, grandpa went to hell. They can get that. And usually they stop right there and they go, thanks. Then they come back to you again. And they say, does the Bible say anything else? Like, can they communicate? You know, that's the big, everybody's getting communications from, you know, all the clairvoyance. So then you take them to, you know, 1 Samuel 31, where Samuel comes back from the grave. And it scares. Did you all catch that story? When the witch at Endor, actually it's in, in verse chapter 28, and, and he dies in 31. But in 28, when, when the witch at Endor is approached by Saul to bring up Samuel, when Samuel comes up out of the ground, everybody that comes back from the grave always comes from below. Hades is beneath. But when he comes up, the witch, what does she do? Why? She's done this professionally for her whole lifetime. She never got a real person before. It, she was scared out of her mind. She dealt with demons. See, demons, demons love I mean, if you want someone from the dead to tell you something, they'll come and tell you whatever. And they know it, too. Can you imagine someone that has lived for thousands of years, knows every language in the world, has traveled everywhere, who has seen everything, could come up... I mean, I can tell stories all day. Can you imagine the stories a demon could tell? And so she was used to people wanting to know something. The demon comes up and says, yeah. I know what's in Damascus. I know what's inside the walls. I've been there many times. I know what's in the king's house. I know how many chariots he has. What else would you like to know? You understand why they make so much money? The, the, the mediums? She got a real person. Scared her to death. But what we find when we look at 1 Samuel 28 and, and look at the rich man and Lazarus and Luke, we find that the Lord tells us nobody can come from the grave back unless he lets them. And he let Samuel come back. He let Moses come back. He let Elijah come back. See, nobody, they don't just come back and forth and, you know, uh, who is it that's always coming back and talking? Shirley MacLaine, I forget who she's always talking to, you know, some Joan of Arc or something, you know, comes back and tells her stuff. No. And so uh, what, with that, what I do is I share with them, to answer your question, I share with them uh, principles and truths about the afterlife without, um, without putting the deceased in hell. I let them put them in hell. Or I let Jesus put them in hell if they read, you know, what Jesus says. But I don't. And I just leave it there. And then I do this. In fact, I do this before, too. Because what it says in the Bible is that before we minister the word, you're supposed to what? Yeah. 
That's Acts 6.4. I hope you realize that. That is one of the biggest counseling verses of all. But we will pray and minister the word. And counseling is ministering the word. And if you minister the word without praying, it's kind of like throwing the gas on without the match. You understand what I mean? It doesn't ignite. The Holy Spirit is one that ignites, that, that explodes the power of the word of God. We don't. It's, so you pray, you share the principles and truth, and then you pray some more, and they start asking. So Bonnie's grandmother started asking me questions. <coughs> and a week before she died, she, come, she comes to Bonnie and says, could you guys stop by? I have another question. And this time she said, her last question was, uh, how can I atone for my sins? And see, that was, she wanted us to share the gospel. And so after all the getting her used to God saying things, but stopping, that's the hardest thing for me. As soon as they let me in, I stop and just give them enough. Most people choke on one truth. Then you keep praying. And, and it's like her sister, Bonnie's sister, who's unsaved. You know, I said, yeah, Iran's in the Bible. I didn't say anymore. And she, Bible. And then about a month later, she called Bonnie and she said, you know, John said Iran is in the Bible. And I looked in mine. What page is it on? You know, she, she couldn't find it. Bonnie said, well, it's called Persia. Oh. She still couldn't find it. She said, could John tell me where it is? Well, then I start telling her about Ezekiel. And, and then she says, well, I don't have time. Just tell me what happens. <laughs> you see, and you just, you keep, but then you stop. So that's how. Who asked that question? Did I, Chris, did I answer enough? So basically, it turns into a evangelistic opportunity in two weeks. When the Lord opens their heart, yeah. Now, the bad thing is when you have to do the funeral of the deceased. Uh, when we lived in California, Bonnie and I lived in an apartment in Los Angeles, uh, a step saver. It was the cheapest one, we, all we could afford. We lived next to a Hell's Angel guy, literally. I mean, I, he was. He was a member of the club. It was on his vest. Uh, black leather, you know, chopper, the whole thing. The bandana, um, chains everywhere. And his, he, he and I would always meet at the mailbox. I mean, it was my encounter with the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, he could say more swear words checking the mail than I don't know what. And uh, Jerry was his name. And so I would say hi to Jerry, and we'd get our mail, and we'd talk about how expensive everything was. And everything, that, all we had in common was how expensive everything was, and we lived in the same apartments. And one day, I didn't go after the mail. I had a meeting, and Jerry came out to the mail, and he fell down flat on his face and died in front of the mailbox like that. Immediately his wife went over and knocked on the door and said to Bonnie, you're the only uh, religious people we've ever met. Would your husband do something for Jerry? Bonnie said, well, what would you, <laughs> he's dead, <laughs> what would you like him to do? And she said, well, the service. And Bonnie said, are you sure you want John to do the service? She said, yeah. It was in Floral, what's the big one in Los Angeles? I mean, the fa it's on TV and everything. It's the biggest cemetery in Los Angeles. It's unbelievably huge. Um, Floral Haven or something like that. And um, 500 of these types of people came to his funeral. When I pulled up to do the service, uh, there were 300 choppers. Have you ever seen that many motorcycles? Like They were all parked in rows. He also was a Civil War enactment. The other half of the audience were wearing outfits like that with their hats and their rifles and everything. I mean, we had the chain side and we had the Civil War side. And what was a blessing is I said that Jerry's wife asked me to come. And what I thought I'd share is the last thing I talked with Jerry about. Because the last time, that's only the Lord, the last time I saw him at the mailbox, I said, Jerry, I would always regret not telling you something. And you know how I always keep, what do I keep in my wallet? A tool, a track. And I started pulling it out. And I said, I have something for you from the Bible. I said, have you ever read the Bible? He said, I never read the Bible. I said, could I share this with you? You know, you don't cram it. it, it it's not like castor oil that you get in as quick as you can so they can spit it out. And so I said, 
can I just share this with you? He said, oh, I mean, we've been checking the mail together for months. So I think, you know, we had a little rapport. And I just went through the, the like, 45-second Romans Road, you know. All are sinners. Christ only died for sinners. And, and if you admit that you're a sinner and receive the free gift, you have eternal life. And he took the track and said, thanks. So at the funeral, I said, can I share the last thing that Jerry heard when I talked to him? And I heard clinking of chains. They all leaned forward. And, and everyone was looking at me, and I, I said, I actually brought it, because I had a copy of the track. You know, I give out the same one all the time. I said, I'll just read it to you, what I read to him. And I read that. And see, that's, I mean, you never know what the Lord will do. And, uh, but you only put in as much as you're praying between. You only stuff as much in as possible. I think sometimes in the past I've stuffed too much because they've never wanted to know more. And so I, I only put in a spoonful. So, Okay, anybody else? We have to go in one minute. So is there a quick one minute? Elaine said she has a coworker whose mother died, and she's convinced her mother is benefiting, blessing her or something. Uh, that is, that is uh, uh, a good one to talk about, especially if you have Roman Catholic. That's Roman Catholic theology, that really good people can bless you from heaven. Um, and uh, one of the, the sweet ladies in the church that has been reaching out to her neighborhood has witnessed all of her neighbors and finally has found a group of them that will come to a Bible study, and she invited them to a Bible study. They went to a Bible study for several months, and she asked me to come and answer their questions. And all of them were Roman Catholics, and that's what they asked me. And uh, they said, uh, could you please explain to us from the Bible um, whether or not Saint, and I don't know all their names, you know, Saint Agnes and Saint George and Saint everybody can protect us. And so what I told them is that you cannot apply uh, the attributes of God that are only God's to people. And uh, basically, if, and, and you don't start with Mary. She's the worst of their theology. But I said, let me ask you this. If St. George can help your son, if that's the one that helps the military, I don't know if it is. But if St. George in heaven can help your son in Iraq, George must be either omnipresent or uh, George must be omnipotent, you know, that he can uh, potent, or, uh, you know, he must be omniscient. Um, omniscient. I said, uh, because he has to either be standing there to hear your son cry out, or he has to be able to, from heaven, know everything, and then he has to have all power to be able to help your son in Iraq. But I said, who promised that they can do that? And I said, God, and that's what makes him God. That's one of his attributes. And so they said, well, then what about Saint? And they named someone else. And I said, okay, you want them to, you know, help you have whatever? I said, either they're omnipresent, omnipotent, or omniscient. And I said, that's only God. So then they said to me, what about and I said, uh, is she omnipotent? Is she omniscient? Is she omnipresent? And so uh, what I would just do with them is I, I talked to them. I said, so your aunt can, or the grandmother, whoever it is, can actually see you at work? They went, hmm. I said, and she can help you at work? Hmm? And where is she? So she can see all the way down here and help you? Hmm. I said, did you know the Bible describes, that is a clear doctrine in the Bible, but there's only one person attached to it. Are you attaching the attributes of God to a person? Now, they don't have to agree with you, and they don't have to accept what you say, but you can declare the truth. And you know what happened at that Bible study? There were seven women. Five of them looked at me, and they said, we never thought of that. And two of them said, we don't care what you say, Mary hears all and helps all, and, you know, whatever it says in the rosary. 
You know what? That's like the sun melts the wax and hardens the clay. And the Spirit of God softened the heart. I think five of them are actually in the process of, from this lady's evangelistic Bible study, getting saved. I don't know what will happen with your friend at work. But see, that's an exercise you can do in a very unoffensive way. Show them the attributes of God and show them that they are attributing those to people. And God says you can't do that. And that's what idols are. You attribute the attributes of God to a, a log or a brass object, okay? It's time to go. By the way, we're going to do this every month. So uh, save them up for, for February. But let's close in a word of prayer, and then you guys can talk, and, and it's time to go. Father, thank you that you've told us that we should give ourselves to prayer and then minister the word. And I pray that uh, we become conscious of that, that our lives would begin with prayer every day, that we would approach your word with prayer, that we'd approach life with prayer, that we would counsel surrounding every word with prayer. And we would see that when we do that, you get all the credit because we realize as we pray that we can't do anything, that apart from you, nothing will happen. Thank you for each one here. We pray for safety tonight. Help us to be able to find places to share your word in everyday life. Open those doors for us, we pray, that you might be exalted in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here.